So our final speaker is Kenny Paul Smith, whose paper is titled Teaching the Superhumanities, Some Modest Reflections. And there'll be time for questions after. All righty. Good afternoon. So I hope you all are having half as much fun as I am. Um, I thought about um, PowerPoint slides. My students say I'm addicted to them, and that's definitely true. But I love this slide. My students love this slide. It is electric. And you know what part, my, well, one, they love the eyes, and they never know why. And they also love, the, the really, really type A's, really love the phrase that's sort of embedded at the top, that the anomalous and the paranormal may well contain seeds for new theory, right? That that's really exciting to me, given my training. And I'm, uh, that gives me a lot of hope for the future, that they find that idea uh, exciting and interesting as well. So um, that's my, this is my PowerPoint slide, right? So let, the, you know, let it zap you, as it definitely, I know it has zapped them. And let me issue a quick thank you to Jeff, to everyone else whose labors are often invisibly rolled into an activity like this, and that you are all sort of like Atlas, if you will, the, the Greek deity holding up the, the bubble universe of our conference. It's such an honor to be engaged in this. And thank you to our excellent presenters um, and to our, our audience. There's a lot really good energy in the room, and there has been since yesterday afternoon. So um, if I was sent home now, I would say, OK, I've got far more than I paid for. I feel like I've learned a lot. So if it's not too late, I also would like the ch to change the title of my talk to something that would better reflect the, the reality. I sent Jeff the title back in January, and it was clean and optimistic, teaching the superhumanities, what could possibly go wrong, <laughs> to now the proper, the proper title, and it does involve a, a finger wag, is in endeavoring to teach the superhumanities, <laughs> i.e. the impossible, in a STEM and football-obsessed R1 University in the American South. <laughs> colon, some modest reflections, right? So I really think that captures it. It really does. Um, so my primary goal in, in talking with you all is to get my portion of it done in, in fewer than 10 minutes um, so that we'll have a little bit of time to talk. We've absorbed so many really beautiful 25-minute talks that when I strategized about this with Jeff a few months ago, he suggested, well, why not try a really brief, targeted, focused talk? And this might be the one chance in the flash talks where people have a chance to ask questions. We'll see if I don't stop with the preliminaries. This won't happen, but I'm going to give it my shot. As it turns out, this is the most difficult talk I've ever put together. And if you've seen me with a laptop in my lap uh, for the last two days, that's why I keep revising it. because. My very bone, the bones of, in the bones of my body, I want to give you all as much detail as possible, which means this will take more than 10 minutes. So I'm going to try really hard to do what is intellectually very difficult for me and, and to give you a very adumbrated or faintly sketched picture of what my efforts have been with my students really over the past 24 years. I've been teaching for just about a quarter century now, and that has really blown up since discovering Jeff's work and getting sort of initiated into the superhumanities, if you will. It's given me a, a category and a framework to work in for which I'll be uh, grateful for into many lives to come, to be sure. So I wanna, what I want to do is, is just sort of sketch out some basic features of what I've tried to do and then the reaction that I've gotten from my students, which is very good for the most part, and from my colleagues, which has been very kind, let me say that, and I'll give you a little <laughs> bit of detail. And then really, you know, as Dr. Finley said last night, I really need your help in whatever suggestions, critiques, criticisms, ideas that you might have so that I can do my job better, really. So um, my intense interest in the paranormal really developed uh, in my childhood. That's a talk in and of itself, to be sure. And frankly, it, it is, that's what drew me to the fields of philosophy and religious studies more than 30 years ago, where I encountered um, a brilliant professional philosopher by the name of Mark Woodhouse, who could come in and lecture uh, for hours without a single bit of notes, uh, no prep at all on any 
anything that you wanted in the history of Western philosophy, and also any category in the paranormal. And I said, you know, I want to be that. I want to be, that's the, that's the person I want to be. And he said, well, give it about 25 years because you've got a lot of work to do. You've got to, as Jeff would say, you have to be Clark Kent and you have to be Superman when you're able to do so. So that's really what first inspired me. And when I moved on to teach myself, the first thing I did, of course, is much like Dr. Woodhouse, I, I was determined to paranormalize. I, don't, I think that's my word, by the way. If the super is Jeff's word, paranormalizing uh, is my word. To paranormalize my conventional courses. And the way my career has developed, that's actually been really fun. Because as a non-tenure track faculty member, I teach six different courses every semester, 14 every year. And I have a whole lot of service commitments that, that I take on willingly, because I love to work with brilliant young people. But to say that my life is full is, uh, is, is probably an understatement. But what that means is, think about the range of courses that I get to teach, religions of the world, introduction to the study of religion, theory and method in the study of religion, indigenous religions, um, philosophy of religion, um, uh, religion in America, and I get to teach in the Honors College, so I get to make up new courses all the time, new religious movements, magic and the American dream, religion and magic, uh, mag uh, relig uh, uh, magic and other worlds, or religion and other worlds, literally, it will go on and on and on. So part, the first prong of my efforts, if you will, uh, has been to paranormalize all of the ordinary courses uh, at least a little tiny bit. Obviously, I have to be careful. The way that I think about it conceptually is I'm bringing things like near-death experiences and the vast amount of amazing literature that documents that phenomena, or after-death communications, or end-of-life uh, uh, experiences, things like that that are actually really, really common to human beings and extraordinarily well documented by all sorts of researchers from all sorts of fields, to bring those into the kinds of conversations that you have in any of those courses. And if you're getting the sense that that won't be the same conversation in each course, you're absolutely right. Right? It's one thing to use, say, Catherine Albanese's study of magic and the history of American culture, as opposed to using, say, Bruce Grayson's book, After, which is a very sort of biomedical study of near-death experience in a course in which you're tracing the theme of other worlds across the history of religions, right? So this has been very, it's been a lot of work, but it's been incredibly fun. And not just for me, I'll tell you what my students have said about this. So. The second prong of what I've tried to do became very, became a lot easier for me when I was hired uh, and it came to LSU in 2015 because um, Dr. Stephen Finley, to his, again, great credit, had already brought the superhumanities to LSU and I have been, I think I've got really good karma. That's what my students say, and really good karma, because these things, these great things happen to me. So I have in inherited a wildly popular course that Dr. Finley created 10, 15 years ago, it was quite a while, Religion and Parapsychology, which I'll arm wrestle you for it at this point, but apparently it is my course now. He has gone on to, to really other and bigger things, right? So what I mean here is I'm especially fortunate in that some of the groundwork has been done for me. Um, there's a whole lot more groundwork to do. Our field, right, this is, these very discussions are highly anomalous in the academic study of religion. Students are often shocked to find out that that's the case, but initiating them, in, in them into the discursive reality of what the academic study of religion is, and then re-enchanting them by studying the paranormal with them, that's actually a lot of fun, right? It takes them on a very interesting tour. So, yeah, so in addition to inheriting Dr. Finley's great course, I have gone on a bit of a campaign, my students sometimes say a rampage, to create as many courses as possible, both for the gen pop, as they call themselves, the general population of students, and also uh, I teach about a third of everything I teach is over in the Ogden Honors College at LSU, which is a fantastic program, and to create as many courses as possible that don't just build in um, paranormality, but that really priv privilege and center what I call the ontological question, which as I frame it goes something like this. Should we, on evidential grounds, take the paranormal seriously, meaning as something that could happen more or less 
as reported. Now again, factoring in some great advice I got from Jeff years ago about the Clark Kent part of your identity versus the Superman or uh, uh, Superwoman or Superperson part of your identity, is I've learned that I don't just have to do this with myself, I really need to do it with my courses, right? So take a course like Religion and Other Worlds, which is explicitly about this idea, this experience, these images, these teachings that show up, of course, as long as there have been human beings in virtually every, uh, every context, that, that this is not the only reality, that there are one or more realities in addition to the ones that we live in, the one we live in, and that, it, that human beings, maybe not everyone, but some people under certain conditions, possibly everybody, can access those realities, and there's probably more than one. There are intelligences and beings that live on those realities. The first thing that I have to do um, is make sure that I do a detailed cultural study and keep this on the level of ideas. So I spend about half of each semester. At LSU, our semesters run about 16 weeks. So for about t eight to 10 weeks, it's all cultural history, right? That's the Clark Kent part of the reality. And I think it's a good practice, not just as a non-tenure track faculty member, to be careful and make sure that everyone is enthusiastic about the idea that I'm uh, retainable if, for the following year. But look, I've been able to pull this off for 25 years in a crazy labor market, right? Where only about 1% of people with PhDs from top programs get permanent jobs, right? The, the, the numbers are, are not even as strong as I think the AAR would like us to believe. They say about 10%. I think the number is about a tenth of that. But the back half of the semester is the ontological problem or the ontological question, right? And of course, that varies depending on the, the, the species of the paranormal that we're looking at, right? And remember, these are undergraduate students. These are oftentimes 18, 19-year-olds, right, who have found themselves at a school that is arguably both very good and very bad at the same time in different ways. It's really complicated. We have almost 40,000 undergraduates, right, from wildly different majors, right, that end up with a class with me. So, <clears throat> but I found that it's crucial, uh, particularly in the courses that I've created in order to focus on the ontological question that I be Clark Kent and that I give them lots of cultural studies first. And psycho institutionally, I've talked about why. Psychologically, it also prepares the ground, right? If they're studying the idea of other worlds in ancient Babylonian myth, like the Epic of Gilgamesh, and then they study it in you know, ancient Egypt and ancient Persia, and they study it in, study it in the Greco-Roman world, in ancient Judaism, in ancient Christianity, medieval Islam. Ah, by the time they get to Bruce Grayson's book, After, which is among the single best studies of um, the near-death experiences that I've ever seen, and I'm familiar with a lot of it. There's a lot of good stuff out there, right? Michael Sabom's book is very good. Uh, Kenneth Ring's stuff is excellent, and I'm forgetting a hundred different authors that I ought not forget, but I like, because I have to pick stuff that not only takes a deep dive, but the chapters need to be brief, right? They really, they need to be brief and they need to be lucid. They need to be clear because in these courses and all the courses the students really love with me, I don't give exams. I don't make them write long research papers. Every single day, if we, if we decide to turn this conference into one of my courses, then that means everybody in virtual land as well, I'm gonna ask you to read one chapter or one article for every day that we show up. And I'm gonna ask you to write at least 500 words about what you read. And I'm gonna ask you to answer one really crucial prompt. What was it that you found really interesting in this chapter? And you need to show me that you understood the chapter. And you also need to show me that you need to explain why you found this or that idea um, important. Now, I, this may seem like a mundane pedagogical point, but I don't think it is. And I, I can't really articulate. I need to find a way to theorize it. But I can't really articulate the connection. But I really feel in my bones. And I see this in the, in the response summaries that they write for me. They usually write about 2,000 words a day for me, and they do this 42 times. So they're writing me 80 to 120 page annotated bibliographies, right? But they're doing it one bite at a time, and it's all about what they think in relationship to the scholarship that they had to go through. And 
brothers and sisters, I, I, I'd love to know what you think, but I'm ab right now, uh, I'm absolutely convinced that there is a very healthy dynamic between studying the superhumanities and getting young people to focus on what it is that resonates with them rather than forcing them to be interested in the questions that you know, I find interesting given, you know, 20 something years of teaching and another decade before that of very rarefied focused education in which I was trained to find other people's questions interesting, right? I got trained to forget and not pay attention to the things that I was really, really interested in, right? That's why I was told, okay, great, you're interested in what we now would call the superhumanities, give it 25 years. And once you get through all of the things, uh, which as a non-tenure track faculty member, by the way, you'll never get through all of the things, right? You're forever in that, maybe one day I'll get a real serious job kind of thing, right? And you just have to get over that and make that okay and be at a place where you have enough levers that you can pull so that you can actually make a living wage and do things that you find really fun. Again, I have very good karma and I have amazing colleagues who even before they knew me, uh, starting to sound like a preacher, even before they knew me, had set the, the groundwork for me, right? So preacher would, could, have been an, could have been a vocation for me, I think. It just didn't work out that way. So two other things that I like to do, or two examples of the same thing, I, that I think that are crucial, they're connected to students finding their own voice, is I like to create um, opportunities for my students, and I mean 18-year-olds that end up in, a, in religion and parapsychology with me, or 19-year-olds. I want to find inst opportunities for them to start to publish uh, in, a, well, in a journal that I have created called Paranormal Culture. It's paranormal-culture.com. And if you would like to take a look at it, we only have one issue out, in part because of what their uh, workload is like and my workload is like, right? By the way, it wasn't my idea. Two of my most, two of the most brilliant students I've ever taught are, they manage it for me. It's completely student managed, it's completely student run. I write for it and I'm kind of the creator. I, I basically sell people on writing for paranormal culture, but I, I know it's important for these young people to say, ah, there's all the academic, academic boxes I'm checking, but this is what I care about, and let me explain to you why. So there are only four pieces up there at Paranormal Culture. We're going to really put a lot of work uh, in it this summer. So if you, have, if you want to participate in any way, we would love for you to get down in that sandbox. If you work with students, graduate, undergraduate, and you think they might be interested, I'd love to have them involved in that as well. We really want to blow up our readership and we want to blow up our writership, right? So that's important. Um, and I think we can do a lot with this. I've tried to do this before uh, with another model um, where, where I did all the work and it went down like the Lusitania because I can, I, can, I can barely even find time and energy to talk to people to get them pumped up about writing for paranormal culture. So the students have to do the work and, and they really are. The other thing that I like to do is I like to create um, a public forum at least twice a year, not three times a year, at LSU. And I try to use LSU-friendly structures for this in which students present their own research in a very public way, in a way that is um, uh, modeled after professional conferences in my own field, the academic uh, study of religion, right? So luckily at LSU, every spring we have this thing called LSU Discover Day, where they do all the work to provide the, uh, the, um, the logistical frameworks, the room, the panel, the refreshments, the, you know, the monitors, and all of these kinds of things. And for several years running now, every year there is at least one panel that tackles this question. The study of the paranormal in the halls of academia. And one thing I've realized in doing all this, just try to put all this together, right? Because the students that show up in the audience are the classmates of the students who are presenting. What is it they're presenting? Well, it's something they probably published or they're going to publish in a, in a, in a more brief or more expanded form on paranormal culture. Where did those ideas come from? They came from response summaries that they wrote about in class, right? And when they show up in class every day, I know I'm zigging around a little bit, they not only have to have something to hand in, they have to talk about it. 
So if you're in the classroom that day, you're going to get called on what did you find interesting and why, right? That there is a kind of magic that happens, I find, when you simply put all these pieces together. It doesn't happen for everyone. Are there a few fellas? No, I'm not implying anything about the people sitting in the back, right? But are there a few fellas, you know, trying to hook up on Tinder, you know, every day while the rest of us have a good conversation? <laughs> yes, they are. There definitely are. And okay, that's fine. I was at that point at some point too in my own uh, personal trajectory. So um, I don't, I'm not a big believer in punishment. We've, we've known for decades that it's a very brittle tool and it doesn't work very well, right? So. Um, I do trust to kind of the magic of all of this, but I find that it works pretty well. Now, let me talk a little bit about the, uh, the reception. On the, part, on the behalf of students, it seems overwhelmingly positive. They love the structure of the exam. Oh, there's one more thing I do as well. I, for the first two weeks, I bring them a very fancy piece of paper with their name printed on it, and I fold it in half and ask them to put it out in front of them. And it's a simple thing, it can seem so trivial, but it's actually made me really good at learning names. And for almost 60 years, I thought I was sort of brain damaged, couldn't learn names. You know what it was? I wasn't really working on it. I never practiced it in a focused way. Imagine that, right? So, but that's part of the structure too. Students will say, I have never felt more seen, even though I was forced to talk about what I wrote about every day, because they learn each other's names as well. They're, again, just like I think there's a magic, there's a connection between them being required to identify and explain what matters to them in relationship to the scholarship, there's also a, there's also a really powerful magic that comes from uh, this being a community. So the students seem to really like it. Um, one other aspect about students here, it doesn't take long before they start sharing their own experiences or they tell stories about their family members so um, two recent examples I had a student who had when he was 14 he was 19 when he found his way into my courses had it was it was in a car accident without a seatbelt and was thrown through the front windshield out onto the hood and he was and he was thrown out farther than his body though his the glass kept his feet from leaving fully leaving the front seat of the automobile but his his energy consciousness, if you will, went further, and he had a full-blown near-death experience. And um, in this NDE, he was in a theater in which he was shown a film of his life, and it, it a number of things that were shown on the film, they, um, they happened in his lifetime, even ones he tried to keep happening. Like there was a girlfriend that was pictured in the film, and apparently he was really in love with her, and in the film, she broke up with him. And he tried really hard to keep that from happening because the girl he saw in the film, he ended up being involved with. And I'm sor sorry to say they did break up. And then he got involved with another, an another young person after that. He saw that in the film. And th the film ends at his graduation, which by the way is happening at Emory right now, at Emory, at LSU right now. So he's actually become a guest speaker at 20 years old, he's or 21 years old, he's become a guest speaker. He comes in and has learned to tell his story, by the way, he hasn't told his family members this story. His mom doesn't know this story. His family apparently, in his view, would not be receptive theologically uh, to these kinds of ideas. Now, I don't applaud the fact that you know, his family doesn't know, but you know, I'm not the thought police. It's not up to me, right? I'm not their RA at their dorm. It's not up to me to determine what they do. They're legal adults. But it's interesting, though, uh, that if he feels uncomfortable sharing this with family members, he seems very comfortable doing it with one course and then with others, right? Um, I had another student tell a story last semester about her mother, and it was a couple of years ago uh, when she was in high school, and all of a sudden, well, during the winter, whenever uh, they were, the, her, the, the mom was driving the student to high school, and her mom would start crying, get very upset every time they passed a certain McDonald's, and nothing had ever happened. But she was, she was sure that something would happen to her son there in that parking lot, even though the son was even younger, right? Was too young to sort of be off on his own. As it turned out a few years later, uh, nothing, the son in, got involved in some very sketchy activity. Um, I won't go into detail about what it was, but it was very dangerous, it was illegal, and he got out of it. But, you know, in her 
understanding. Where, you know, as we studied, say, Eric Wargo's book, Time Loops, and if, if you want a great book to sit down and read this summer, read Time Loops, right? It's all about this loopy phenomena in which something in the future seems to retrocausally uh, uh, bring something to be in the past. Literally, it's the opposite of how we all think about time, and he makes a really good case for it. But when students start sharing stories like that, they give other people permission to remember things, right, that happened to them. And if, and perhaps, you know, to turn, to log off of Tinder and share those stories themselves. I do get occasional debunkers, and they are welcome as well. And I understand they're using mostly rhetorical strategies. They are, and that's fine. That's just where they are. And you know, a college-level course at a public university, in my mind, is an open place for everyone to develop and refine their own view. So if they don't want to, you know, if they want to stay there, that's perfectly fine. But they have to give everybody else lots of freedom to do what they want to do, right? Um, my colleagues relentlessly treat me with incredible kindness and respect and support and encouragement. In fact, just to show you how good my karma is, they came to me and asked me to teach religion and parapsychology, right? So that's really weird. That's the one course I really wanted to teach 30 years ago that Dr. Woodhouse said, give it 25 years. He was, he was almost right. Luckily, it didn't take that long. Um, that said, let me leave you with this. And I'm pretty sure I've overshot the 10 minute mark, I'm sorry. <laughs> My colleagues, um, my colleagues, I'm both irritated and sympathetic at this, and I am being video recorded. So my colleagues um, <laughs> insist that the, what I call the superhumanities is really just theology in new age dressing. They would say, what's the difference between what you do, uh, you know, when you focus on the ontological question, what's the difference between that and a, and a Baptist street preacher uh, we're blessed by their presence all the time at LSU, wonderful people, you know, who get in your face and call you a fornicator. That's what they always call me. I don't think they've looked up that word, right? <laughs> because they're trying to convince me that, that there's a hell and I'm going to be in there pretty much permanently, and I ought to believe that and change my life, right? right? They're colorful guys, I'll give you that. And I, by the way, I have a student that is studying them ethnographically. And he's a freshman, and he's doing a really good job right, of it. Yeah, it's amazing what young people can do at a very, very young age and do very well with a little bit of guidance, right, and a lot of encouragement and whatnot. But this is a long discussion, I think, to how to respond to colleagues who, again, reduce what we're doing to theology. Uh, there are a couple of different ways we can go there in thinking about that response. Um, I will definitely be bothering Jeff about this all summer long. So just, I'm sorry. You're right. So, all right. I'm gonna, now I'm going to try to stop talking and see in what we got about seven or eight minutes. That's something at least, right? See if we can have a little bit of Q&A if you want to. So thank you all.